Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Right, right, I'm gonna do a bit of homework on that one. Um, the proliferation of these gagging orders do seem to be peculiar to Theresa May's regime and the idea that at this period of unprecedented political instability the government is banning businesses and charities from telling us the extent of the instability I mean, should really frighten everyone but you know I'm sure we're going to get angrier about some student in fancy dress or, or, or somebody being banned from I don't know, shouting obscenities from their bedroom window. Four minutes after 11 is the time. Um, before 12 o'clock, we'll catch up with Simon Marks, one of my favourite broadcasters, and um, LBC blessed to have him as our American correspondent. Simon will be joining us to talk us through the midterms, which strike me as something of a cure its egg, i.e. good in parts. Um, everyone can... I, Donald Trump, needless to say, had described it as a, as, as a victory, a massive success, but he would have done that even if he'd lost everything, you know. And Donald Trump was sitting on Tim Pan Alley, with a cap in front of him and a harmonica in his tiny little hands. He'd be claiming that things were all going brilliantly and that he was still the biggest genius on the planet. But but he increased, you could tell by where he went to speak that they kind of accepted they were going to lose Congress and that he put all of his efforts into into the Senate seats that could have been vulnerable, and he's done better. Um, and again, it's not a surprise. <laughs> Fascism does not rise in democracies like Germany or Italy or Spain. It doesn't happen, well, not so much Spain, uh, but it doesn't happen by accident, okay? People fall for it. And if they are uh, particularly susceptible to economic crises or refugee movements, they are even more likely to fall for it. So it, it's not a mystery quite why so much of the mainstream media sits there wringing its hands and knitting its brows and go, oh, why are people, are they left behind? Is it the economic, no. It's, it's just a massive racist standing up and saying all your problems are the fault of foreigners. Trust me and I'll fix your problems. So Donald Trump fans today, if you ask them what they're celebrating, they'll say, well, you know those hungry Honduran children who are marching thousands of miles to escape poverty and, and famine? <laughs> Their life's about to get a lot worse. That's, that's what Donald Trump fans are celebrating today. Those hungry children who are... And a hundred of them have disappeared. They're thought to have been kidnapped by people traffickers. Great, say Donald Trump fans. Hopefully even more of them will be. Yeah, Donald Trump fans. The uh, spiritual twins of people traffickers. So we'll do that at 12.45, 11.45. Before that, I, I'm drawn to this story, and I don't think we've done this before, or I've got a horrible feeling we might have done it and it might not have gone well, which is why we never did it again. Uh, in the next hour, we will address this most magnificent of headlines. Are we heading for a bacon tax? What would you prefer? Ferrari call it a sausage tax. I think that's got more comedic potential than a bacon tax. A sausage tax. I quite like a lard tax. Shall we have a sausage tax? We'll talk about that in the next hour. And we'll also talk about the death threats that have been issued to people selling Christmas turkeys by... Yes, you got it, by vegans. Um... But it's the European army story that intrigues me. Do you remember in, in the run-up to the referendum and, and before, it was a real hot potato, wasn't it? Just to keep the vegans happy. It was a real hot potato. And the idea was that the idea of us joining forces militarily with many of our NATO allies, but in a more specifically European structure, was awful. Uh, Nick Clegg, so I think on the back foot, very foolishly uh, insisted that it could never happen. I presume that Nick Clegg's position was it could never happen while Britain was a member of the European Union if Britain didn't want it to happen such being the power of veto enjoyed by all member states but the whole point about Brexit is that even the people talking sense got squeezed by sound biting, didn't they? So it becomes, there is no prospect whatsoever of a European army, says Nick Clegg. And then when President Macron comes out, as he has done, and calls for a real European army, everyone goes, oh, Clegg, you big liar. Sooner you flip off to Facebook, then the better for all concerned. But I'm pretty sure Clegg never said what people lazily criticising him today accuse him of saying, because there could easily be a European army if all European Union member states want one. That's called democracy. Clegg's position would have been, if we really, really don't want one, we could veto it. Which is actually slightly less democratic, you could argue. If 26 member states want something and one doesn't, the one has the power to stop the 26 from doing it. But we're leaving soon anyway. 
So it becomes a more realistic proposition. But I, I, I've heard it a lot, and you hear it from all the usual suspects, the, the sort of despicable belch of beery flatulence, right, through to the kind of Boris Johnson school of bloviating nonsense. And the unquestioned position is, ah, oh, we're going to call it the gammon tax. We can't call it the gammon tax. That would be like charging people for being stupid and racist. We have to go with bacon tax, gammon tax. Imagine a gammon tax. Cool, if we had a gammon tax, we could solve... So instead of banging on about foreign aid, saying, oh, I'll tell you what, if we ban foreign aid, we could have six million policemen by tea time. Well, how about bringing in a gammon tax? This is going to be the decent liberal response to ludicrous exaggerations about what, what we could do with foreign aid money. So why don't we bring in a gammon tax? We could have six billion police officers on the streets of London by tea time tonight if we brought in a gammon tax. Make all the gammon pay £100 every time they say something racist. We'd be quids in. We'd be laughing. That's it. I'm campaigning. This is my first platform, putting it together. The gammon tax. I should tell you, I'm delighted to report that gammon has been added to the Collins Dictionary as word of the year. Oh, you can smell it roasting from here, can't you? It's outrageous, it's racist, it's just got... No, mate, it's nothing to do with your skin colour. Although you are looking a little pink today. It's everything to do with your opinions. Biggest gammon we've had on the programme this year? Philip in Sandbach, probably, wasn't it? Don't you think? And, and, and he was... I think he described himself as a Ugandan Asian. So it's nothing to do with skin colour, my dudes. It's everything to do with rancid opinions. However, I digress. We won't be introducing a gammon tax any time soon. But the gammon, of course, are, are the army most outraged by the prospect of a European army. Why? And, and I am being a little bit glib here. I, 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 I'm, I'm perfectly open to the possibility that there are meaningful objections to an army that would see countries that even within living memory have been each, at each other's throats historically unifying and joining forces in the, in the, in the pursuit of peace and in the pursuit, of course, of standing up to shared threats. So, in a nutshell, why would an army we're in spook people so much? Is it that kind of post-Second World War hangover, which is probably common for an awful, responsible for an awful lot of the problems we're facing at the moment, you somehow find the idea of a German general ordering British troops around utterly abhorrent? which is Brexit itself in a nutshell, because what, what your Brexit has taught us is that there are plenty of people in this country, um, possibly best described by the Collins Dictionary word of the year, but they would rather be saluting an English captain on the bridge of a ship that's sinking at a rate of knots than actually be part of the officer class on a ship that happens to be currently captained by a Belgian or a German or a Frenchman, but the crew below, like the um, HMS Victory at the Battle of Trafalgar, has got more different nationalities in it than the United Nations. And that's, that's nativist exceptionalism. What, what, why, why, why don't you want to be on this ship? It's the best ship on the high seas. I mean, it is literally by far the best ship in the world. Yeah, but the captain's German. Oh, OK, what are you going to do? I'm going to swim. I'm jumping overboard. I'm going to swim. Brexit. And I think the same might be the same with the army. Is it? Is it just the case that, well, I don't want to be in an army? Because NATO sees British troops take orders from foreign generals. What's, what's, what's the difference? What's the problem? Is it just the Germans? Is that what we're looking at here? Yet more anti-German rhetoric. Because one of the most interesting things I've learned about the European Union since we voted to leave it um, is that the Brits are perceived as being a fulcrum between competing priorities for France and Germany. So historically, French Franco-German tensions are seen as the abiding theme of European politics, with the Brits operating as a sort of check and balance on their historical, uh, not, not, yeah, we'll just say tension, okay? Their historical tensions. Because if you have a rapacious German army seeking to expand, France is pretty near the top of the list of, of what they've got their eye on, and vice versa with, 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 I suppose you go back to Napoleon, would you, for French imperial ambitions? So why would an army that sees historic enemies join forces for a common good be a bad thing? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, James, you probably should have asked this question before the European Union referendum, because that spectre or prospect of a European army was used to spook people. So my question now becomes, why is it spooky? Why are people spooked by the prospect of a European army? 
0345 606 Again, I, I speak to you if you are slightly to the right of Genghis Khan. Would you really rather have a British army presided over by Jeremy Corbyn or a European army presided over by all the European Union leaders? 0345 606 13 minutes after 11, um, we will not protect the Europeans unless we decide to have a true European army. Mr Macron, who I should tell you his approval ratings are appalling at the moment, faced with a Russia at our frontiers that has shown that she can be a threat. We need a Europe that defends itself better alone without just depending on the United States. Now just think about this for a moment. Russia has already declared war on the West. OK? Call it cyber war, call it soft war, call it whatever you will. If you think I'm exaggerating, two words. Sergei Skripal. Four words. Andrei Litvinenko. OK? They send goons to this country to kill people on our streets. That's a declaration of war. Yeah, of sorts. If that's not enough for you, the bombardment of British social media with divisive and dishonest... Do you know what else they do? I told you earlier in the week, the biggest thing that the Russian troll factories do is punt anti-Islamic feeling in Britain and America, which has obviously been hugely successful. But they also do stuff like anti-vaccines. If you see something on social media discouraging you from vaccinating your children, it is perfectly possible that it has its roots in Russia. That's a declaration of war. That is making us less stable and less safe as a population. And also, people will die of measles unnecessarily. Herd new, uh, immunity will be compromised. So Russia is attacking us in millions and millions of different ways. It is not beyond the realms of possibility that they might start attacking us, or at least European countries. Well, they have, haven't they, in a way, if you take Europe as a geographical concept rather than a political one, they have annexed annexed territories that were, weren't theirs and they haven't been properly punished. So Macron says, Russia is a threat to us all. The American president, the current American president, is almost certainly in hock to Putin, either through fear of um, uh, having embarrassing disclosures made or through actually financial arrangements would also be embarrassing disclosures but the collusion is uh, the only thing that's not proved um, again we sit here and I have to say stuff out loud you think that Trump's uh, presidential campaign wasn't compromised why are his two campaign managers in jail <laughs> well why have his two campaigners been jailed I may have lost track of whether or not they're on bail at the moment or not I and mean, it's just incredible, really, what we're allowing the West to become. And it's all at Putin's behest. So when Macron says, look, look what Russia's done. It's killing people on our streets. It's compromising our democracies. It's interfering in our elections and our referendums. It's probably got a puppet president in the White House. If we are facing a military threat from Russia, dudes, we should probably join forces, says a Frenchman to a German and a Spaniard and an Italian and a Hungarian. Hmm, there's a problem there, isn't there? Italy and Hungary, probably a lot closer to the Putin-Trump axis than they are to the European Union one. But there's the point. Okay, there's your analysis. There's your description. Why is it a bad thing? 03456060973. 17 after 11. The armies I don't like are the ones that are my enemies. Why should I be opposed to an army that I could be in? This is my question in response to Emmanuel Macron's suggestion that given that America is currently... Uh, increasingly chaotic and despotic and Russia is increasingly aggressive and um, acquisitive European nations should uh, cooperate a little more closely under the auspices of what we could call a European military alliance or army as opposed to the North Atlantic military alliance or NATO. Greg's in Bangkok Crikey, one night eh Greg how long are you there for? Uh, I, I live here. Oh. I, I listen to your show on the way home. It's kind of perfect commuting. Uh, oh, you lucky time. man. You luck, uh, lucky, lucky <laughs> man. Well, I, mean, I love Thailand. Bangkok can be a bit of a headache, but I presume you've got beautiful it, little it, bowl it holes. Can a little bit. What's on your mind? Yeah, every, every now and then. Um, so, I mean, this, this was basically my dad's reason for voting to, for Brexit. And right. I tried to argue him out of it. I mean, my argument was, you know, for, to argue him out of it was that, okay, you've got a, you've got a veto at the moment, but yes. if you leave, you're not going to have a veto. But, but as I understand it, it was basically about the, the nature of, of how your, it's not your the, military It's not the best be phone line. It's not, it's not the best phone line. So I, I'm going to be quiet and listen to you until it reaches, if it reaches a point where, where it's unsustainable, all right? 
Okay, no worries. Carry on. Um, so, uh, as I understand it, if, uh, if a NATO country gets attacked, then it can ask the other NATO countries for, you know, to respond, right? And there's a responsibility to respond. But the, the individual countries have to take a vote on that in their parliament. You know, they have to commit uh, specific units to that NATO force, right? Um, whereas if it's a, a standing European army, like a permanent European army, then you you can't you kind of can't have that with with every with every instance. You know, the, it could be that if half of, you know more than half of Europe wanted to I don't know go to war with Russia or Turkey or that you might that they might be able to outvote. Britain or outvote any individual country and say, well, but there's no, there's no not, real evidence. Might not want to go to war. Uh, the, Yeah, I, I mean, you, you might be right, but the thing that Macron's talking about is is um, emergency joint operations, uh, a, a European intervention force that only nine EU states would be would be part of anyway. I, so it is, and, and your dad clearly is part of this perception as well. It's, 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 it's more a fear of what might happen than a fear of what they're actually proposing. Uh, you know, for, for my money, I don't actually think that it's necessarily a bad idea, but I think that that was the, that was the fear of it. You know, that was the argument against it. But then, but then you could, you you could just could politically resist it, couldn't you? There's no earthly way that we'd ever sign up for something that demanded that we send troops for, 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 for military interventions that we didn't want to be part of. That's the question, though, isn't it? We, you know, so that's the fear, is it, that it, we'd have to go and fight I, I, wars I that, think that's the fear. that our own government and, and didn't want that, to fight? Yeah, and I think there may also be an element of, uh, like, like British troops, um, you know, operate under American command all the time, right? Yes. But I assume there's, like, a level of faith in the competence of American command. I don't know if that faith would exist if the command was from Luxembourg or Belgium. Or don't, I don't think either you know of those I mean? are, in, are I, in the I, nine, I, but I no, know. I hear you. No, I get it. And, and you've been really helpful, actually, and you've, 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 you've managed not to be disloyal to your dad as well, which is important, because there are reasonable concerns in the, in the detail of what Greg tells us. Um, and they are ones that we should probably address. Your European powers are at odds with America on the scrapping of the nuclear treaty with Iran. There are various different areas in which American policies could be perceived as threatening Europe, but it's not in any way yet, and I don't think anyone seriously thinks it might be a, a military threat, but he, he does seem to think that there are threats to peace that emanate from some of America's policies. Uh, they've abandoned the 1987 U.S.-Soviet Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. That means, uh, although Russia were uh, horribly in breach of it, both countries now are free to increase medium-range nuclear missiles on our continent. <laughs> it's a point you have to remember. So well, what is it? Is it just a mistrust of, and, and Greg put this very diplomatically, it's just more mistrust of foreigners. In which case, I always come back to this thing, and I wish I'd thought of this before the vote. Would you really, if you're a British Conservative, you really would rather have Jeremy Corbyn in complete control of your country than have some pooled sovereignty with a Conservative leader like Angela Merkel? That's the bit I'm confused by. The checks and balances it puts upon individual democracies to ensure that they don't go down dark and dangerous paths. I'm, I'm not for the record. I, I, I haven't got a T-shirt for a European army. I've just got questions. And my key question is, why would we be spooked by an army we'd be in? Adam is in Newbury. Adam, what do you think? Well, uh, I don't think you need to be to the right of Genghis Khan to see that it's an utterly ridiculous idea. Um, so uh, I almost don't know where to start. But firstly... Uh, well, let's start the, with the your thoughts on NATO, because, I mean... Well, OK, so my thoughts on, on NATO. Uh, NATO does the job, essentially, uh, that a European standing army would do. Mm. With, uh, with, if, with American patronage, and, and we now have an American president who's professed profound misgivings and scepticism about NATO's future. Well, you know, uh, one, I don't think that Donald Trump is going to be with us for very much longer. Um, you know, uh, well, I do. No more than two years. I think he's more uh, likely to, to get re-elected, but we can't. We can't base our views on a European army on the well, hope that Donald Trump well, loses exactly. his presidency. Well, we can't base our views on 
uh, European army because Donald Trump is the president. Exactly. You said uh, you've hit the nail on and, the head. And he doesn't this like NATO. Ridiculous. This is ridiculous posturing by uh, President Macron. There's no appetite. I'm just going to. I just want to take you back because I, I am interested in what you said. And you said you didn't know where to start, and I don't think we have properly started yet. You say NATO already does everything that any European ar army would do. I point yeah. out that the most senior member of NATO, America, is currently led by a man who has expressed his dislike of NATO. So, in many ways, I think a logical analysis of your words so far would come down in favour of forming a European army because okay. NATO is so fractured. Tell me. You tell me why Donald Trump dislikes NATO. Well, I don't know. Probably know because why. he's stupid. I'll tell you then. Let me tell you. Well, I can't disagree with that, actually. But his reason for disliking NATO is because that out of the uh, all of the NATO uh, signatories, all of the countries that uh, make up NATO, only four of them pay the amount of money that they all commit to pay, which is uh, 3%, if I'm not mistaken, of... Um, GDP towards their uh, defence budget. So you said earlier... Well, that's his professed that, reason, Adam. No, well, Adam, that's you, a blooming good reason. It's quite a good reason, but, but it have, also comes you with... You said, would, you, no, hang on, I'm not, we're not arguing. You know, we're not arguing. Well, I, you've, you just said, you answer me a question. You such a load of old rubbish, and oh, then you don't go. expect people to... Um, to, to come back at I, I, I have. You've come back at me. You've said the okay, reason Donald I, Trump I, doesn't I, like NATO is because the, the other members don't pay their way. Far away. Okay. It's also possible that Donald Trump doesn't like NATO because of the um, links, if you like, with Vladimir Putin and Vladimir Putin's recorded resentment oh, of NATO. <laughs> what, what, what's wrong with that? Oh, you are ridiculous. Oh, I, I know, Adam. Vladimir Putin loves NATO. You're ridiculous. He love, why does Vlad, Vlad, he loves NATO, doesn't he? Do you, well, I, 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 uh, I yeah, think that yeah. Vladimir Putin is frightened of NATO. Yes. And NATO, as, as he proved in the Ukraine and Crimea, any. and was you was the Ukraine part of NATO? Ukraine wasn't protected by NATO. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's why are we why. arguing, Adam? You, you've just said that because we don't need you, a European you, you, Union you, you, because NATO does I didn't the job. Actually, say we don't need a European Union army. I we, we don't, don't need, need a European, European army because army. NATO does such a great job. And now you're telling no, me how I bad NATO say, is. I didn't say that uh, NATO. Doesn't, uh, I, I didn't say that. What I said was that it would be duplication. Yes, but it now you've told us that NATO isn't out. very good. Well, I waited for you. Yes, you did. It would be expensive yes. duplication. Okay. So most of the European countries, Spain, Germany, um, Holland, uh, uh, the, the larger companies, Italy, do not pay their way in NATO. They expect to be protected and they don't anywhere near pay their way. What on earth would make you think that they would pay their way if um, if there was a European army? They'd have to. So firstly, they don't want to. Well, they have to. <laughs> don't be ridiculous. They, <laughs> no, I know. They, 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 uh, yeah. they, nobody wants it apart from Macron. He only wants it for his ego and for the greater glory of France and because he utterly despises America and has done since America saved their bacon in the Second World War. Oh, mate. And, well, you know, oh, mate. How old was like. he when America saved their bacon in the Second World War? Fr the uh, French nationalists. Oh, mate, you said Macron hate and you said America. he's hated them since America saved As France in the Second World War. So I just asked how old he was when that happened. As the president of France. Answer the question, Adam. How old was well, he, he when was, that thing he happened? He to be born. He was a right. twinkle in his parents' eyes. But eye. he hates it. He absolutely does. Yeah. Carry on, mate. I, I'm, I'm not going to interrupt you anymore. It's too much fun listening. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, excellent. Well, uh, so, uh, the, it can't be afforded. Right. Um, uh, uh, most European countries have utterly hopeless armies. I laughed my brains out when you said I, that... I, um, I, I thought you might have done. Angela Merkel, <laughs> Angela Merkel would be better than Jeremy Corbyn in charge of uh, uh, an army. I didn't Angela say that. Merkel, I didn't say yes, that. Did. No, I didn't. Exactly I said if you said. were a British right-winger, would you rather have Jeremy Corbyn in complete charge of everything or have some pulled or, or sovereignty Angela with a fellow oh, Conservative uh, like that, Angela that's Merkel? A, that's, a, that's a choice, isn't it? Angela Merkel, whose own army has insufficient guns, so on exercise, Mate, we weren't on talking. Oh my days, Adam. Her army uses broomsticks yes. and shout bang. Okay, Adam.
This is a country that does not pay its way. Yes, I, you, you, you've said that a lot, and, and I've, I, I haven't really enjoyed talking to you, but I'm two and a half minutes late for the news, so I hope we both feel you've had a fair crack of the whip. In conclusion, Emmanuel Macron hates America because America bailed out France in the Second World War before Emmanuel Macron was born. When you said that you laughed your brains out, I didn't realise you were talking literally. Um, it's only been invoked once. I didn't know that. The principle of collective defence upon which NATO was founded. Can you guess when? Where, where, when was the principle of collective defence um, activated? It means that an attack on one member or more, one or more members, is considered an, an attack against all. Donald Trump, of course, already on the record saying that if, for example, Montenegro came under attack, then he wouldn't want Americans getting involved in that. So he's already... Um, revealed his reluctance to abide by the rules of NATO and um, I, I, like a lot of people he's also revealed his ignorance of how NATO is funded. Um, it's about domestic military spending. It's, it's about how much of your GDP is spent on um, your own army. So NATO issues a guideline that stands at 2% of GDP. There's no penalty for not meeting it but there's nothing to prevent you from spending more or less as a sovereign nation than you want to. So, I, I mean, Adam had sort of half a point. Actually, that's not true. He had about a tenth of a point because he reflects Trump's ignorance regarding NATO funding. But the fact is that many countries don't meet that 2% guideline target and, there, and there's no penalty for doing so. But it's about how much you spend on your domestic army. So it's entirely up to America how much it spends on its domestic army. And it's entirely up to you whether you feel that Donald Trump has the interests of other countries in his heart. And because he clearly doesn't, Emmanuel Macron, motivated by events that occurred before he was born, is determined to set up some sort of alternative military alliance to NATO, which would be able to move more quickly and more um, effectively in the theatre of Europe. Which seems to me to be fairly straightforward, with misgivings, obviously. But the level of spookedness, I suppose, only becomes easy to understand when you start hearing about why it's all because... A Frenchman hates America after America uh, came to their rescue in the Second World War, and, and this is these are the these are the bridges upon which Britain is dying at the moment. These ludicrous commando comic interpretations of international history from people so utterly persuaded of their own correctness that they actually can't see sense as it settles on the end of their nose. Craig's in Kings Winford, lovely part of the world. Craig, what would you like to say? Um, to your show this morning, um, I put, I'm a former soldier, I've served in the British infantry, uh, in, in the Grenadier Guards for many years, uh, across many theatres of operations. Uh, we done our serving alongside the French and the Germans, full stop, and taking commands. It does happen, uh, but the German generals and, and French generals, they don't understand how a British soldier like myself thinks and operates, and where, where we come from, and why we join the army. Go on, th th this is interesting to me. Um, well, I'll give you some examples. Back in Bosnia in 1993, the siege of Srebrenica, the map was turned out to be a massacre. French troops let the Serbs come rolling through the blockade and start wiping out uh, Muslim men and, and, and children. And they just stood there and there it happened. Now, if that was British forces there, up, up, up in that part of the country, we'd have stopped it, we'd have gone to action. I, listen, I'm not going to argue with you, but there are plenty yeah. of examples in history of British military mistakes. We, we have made mistakes in this in the year, but not, not on that scale, so... Well, that's also, not what, really... Ch I mean, one thinks of Gallipoli, and if you go back, you could go back to the Charge of the Light Brigade if you wanted to, but I'm not... As I say, I'm not arguing with you, but I'm neither am I allowing it to pass that the British Army is perfect and or infallible, and arguably, if there are flaws in the other forces, the likelihood of removing them or addressing them or improving them would be increased by greater cooperation. So well, they could they could learn. The members of the they British could learn Army. from us. It's they could learn. A volunteer army. They could learn from us. Yeah, but you serve alongside German soldiers. Some of them are conscripts, conscripts on their two-year service, alongside French. Now, as a professional soldier, why would I want to serve alongside someone who's been forced to do that job? I, I agree, and that would be something that if we were part of setting up a European um, military alliance, we would make it clear it's that, never we, happen. that we don't... It probably isn't, but it, it would be our job, wouldn't it, to explain why we don't want conscripts in this part of our army. 
So that's easily I'll give you that's easily dealt with. James, uh, Carry on. Night have, night have only exists on paper. Back in 2006, when we was out in Afghan, down in Helm and Provost, Provost, where all the forging was happening and all the operations were being carried out. The British Army, we was at Harvest stressed. we was covering an area the size of Wales. Yes. We went to the German forces and the French, capping and saying, we need more guys to carry out combat operations down in Helmand Province yes. to consolidate the positions that we've just taken from the Taliban. They turned and said, no, they we're not doing that. We're staying up in Kabul. Exactly. If there was a European army, they wouldn't have any choice. Well, NATO is a European army. Well, NATO's only been activated once. Which was after after the exists, September it's 11 attack. It only exists. Well, no, because it, it is there to respond to an attack upon a member state. And there haven't been any attacks upon member states since it was instituted, except the attack upon the Twin Towers on September the 11th, which is the only case in recorded history of the collective NATO response being activated. And, and the proof of that particular pudding, I think, lies in the answer to this question. Who was in overall charge? of troops in Afghanistan. Who was, who was an overall... It was overall char charge. It was a, a US general. There you go. Not a British general. No, but, you know, Britain and America work alongside quite, quite closely, no, especially the generals and the brigadiers. Historically, they do, with an American president who likes NATO and who believes in protecting Europe and who sees the role of America as a sort of international police force, but we ain't got a president like that anymore. OK, James, I'll put something to you right. Hang if on. you were serving in the British Army and yes. you was a platoon sergeant... I, I may not have the knowledge to answer this question, but I'll do my best, Craig. You know, like I was in charge of 34 guys. Yes. Who would you rather be taking operational commands off? Would you be taking it off a, ger a German general or a French general or off a British general? Or so an American. Gone, gone through the same training but, process but, as yourself. But we've just done this. We've just said who was in overall charge in, in Afghan, and the answer was an American. So, my, Even though it's overall Craig, charge, I, I'm going to answer your question. Yeah. I, I want to take orders off the best general. Yeah, which is probably a British general Great. at the end of the day. But, but, but I don't actually care what nationality he is. I want the best man to be in charge. You, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a... And the, likely, the likelihood you know, of... You start the, spelling out I'm absolute not, rubbish oh, on mate, the radio. I'm not spelling out anything. Look at your history. I've answered your and question. And get a bit of understanding how the British forces operate. Yeah, I know. I know, in, in alliance with lots of other forces. Yeah, Unless, you know, can you think of a war that we fought without? Other armies Falk alongside Falk us? Falklands War, 1982. Didn't get any support. We got support from Reagan, didn't we? Yeah, we got satellite support. But again, the French, they were su supplying exit missiles to the Argentinians. France was part of NATO. The same NATO that we were members of. And if we were on the same team, if we were more entrenched on the same team, you don't think that the likelihood of us acting against each other's interests diminishes? I mean, this is... Uh, you were a bit rude to me, but I'll let that pass, because this I'm is... I'm a bit rude to you, James. You, you need no, you to did, start you did understanding just, uh, your history uh, uh, mate, I've, got, uh, I've got a pretty good grasp of history, but the but, tension between us seems to be that you think because things done by our allies in the past have been less than perfect. If we made the alliance stronger, those imperfections would increase. And I, I think I would argue, and remember, I don't really have a dog in this race, Craig. I'm intrigued by other people's opinions more than espousing my own today. But my position would probably be that if our allies have flaws and imperfections that damage us, then a closer alliance makes it easier to remove those flaws and imperfections. Surely that makes some sense. Those NATO should be broken up. Same and, as European and, and, Union. and that is why we would need a European army. Otherwise, we'd have no allies. We should allies be left. shaking hands with the Russians well, and being with, allies with the Russians. You, you think we should be shaking hands with the Russians and being allies Absolutely. with the Russians? Okay. Russia and in, that, the biggest, in, in that case, I'm cool. We've got the largest no. Europe, Eastern European armed forces on the planet now. Yes, I, in that case, I'm cool with your criticisms, Craig. That's absolutely fine. Um, and I, I thank you for your service. It is 11.46. We're going to get meaty in the next hour. I, do you know, there is that sense bubbling under the surface that that eating meat is, is moving into the realms of smoking. Because, of course, you, if you're younger, you won't realise just how normal smoking cigarettes used to be um, and could, of course, be again. Just to clarify a couple of factual points from... Um from the last call, uh, there hasn't been any conscription in the German army since 2011, but of course in the Russian army it's compulsory for every single male aged between I think 18 and 27, so I, I just put that out there. I sometimes wonder why I bother. 
11.51 is the time. Simon Marks is LBC's American correspondent, or Washington reporter, to be more specific. He's been keeping an eye on these midterms that have unfolded overnight. It, in, in many ways, um, from a journalistic point of view, Simon, it's the worst possible outcome because everybody's claiming a victory. <laughs> yes, I think that's right, James. I mean, there's something for everybody uh, in this election result. Uh, for the Democrats, control of the House of Representatives. They've uh, gained 26 seats from the Republicans in the battle to control the House of Representatives. And Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi is now set to be the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. She is vowing to block President Trump at every single turn. And there's no question that a 9% swing to the Democrats uh, was an impressive result for her and for those candidates uh, who wanted to uh, move to Washington, D.C. and occupy uh, seats that the Republicans have been sitting in in the House of Representatives. Evidence in this vote particularly uh, that suburban women uh, gave up on President Trump in droves. That will give the Democrats some comfort and some heart as they prepare for the big race to come, the 20 20 presidential election, but there was comfort for the Republicans in all of this as well, because Donald Trump has actually extended his majority in the U.S. Senate by uh, at least two seats, with a handful more uh, still to finalize their results. And I think Donald Trump will definitely view that uh, as a win. There are other things that he's viewing as a win as well. He's been on Twitter, where else, this morning, uh, insisting that the White House phone lines of lit up with foreign leaders who, as he put it on Twitter, were waiting him out, uh, calling to congratulate him on his capital B, capital V, big victory last night. He also says, now we can all get back to work and get things done. Yes. Uh, that's extremely unlikely because with the Democrats controlling the House of Representatives, what's actually going to happen here is the beginning of a scorched earth 2020 presidential election campaign. I think he can pretty much kiss goodbye to his legislative agenda. But he probably won't mind. This is me now doing a bit of analysis, which you're welcome to laugh at. Because he, no, he doesn't really I'm like never. doing governing. He doesn't like doing governing <laughs> in, the, in the boring, detailed sense of the word. And he loves being on the road, um, uh, sort of talking to cheering crowd. So if, if you're saying that legislatively the current presidency is over, uh, he, he would probably say, great, I'm just going to go and do rallies for two years. And that increases his chances you know, of winning again in 2020. You're allowed to laugh. That that No, that analysis, I think, is absolutely on the money. There oh, is boy. nothing Donald Trump <laughs> relishes more than a big fight. And he's got a brand new target now available to him. He can stop talking, if he wants to, about Hillary Clinton and lock her up. And he can start talking about Nancy Pelosi, who's going to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He has already characterized her and those Democrats heading into the House of Representatives as radical Democrat socialists. And you're going to hear more and more and more from him uh, about that. The Democrats are celebrating the fact that a record number of uh, LGBTQ candidates were elected to the House of Representatives. They're celebrating the fact uh, that two Muslims become the first Muslim Americans uh, to sit in the House of Representatives. But, you know, I think Donald Trump... Trump may view all of that as something of a win for yes. him. This was not the national repudiation of President Donald Trump and his administration that Democrats had hoped for. This was not the blue wave that they'd been uh, looking for. And the evidence of that is the gains that the Republicans uh, have made in the House of uh, in, in the That's U.S. Fair. Senate yes. and the fact that they haven't lost as much ground as some had hoped they would uh, in the House of Representatives. So a Donald Trump who is is now relishing the prospect of viciously and vigorously going after whoever ends up being the Democratic Party's presidential candidate in 2020 can at least plan to spend 2019 drawing battle lines with those Democrats in the House of Representatives whom he is going to argue are bedeviling the will of the voters in the 2016 presidential election and stopping him from getting on with the business of making good on the promise that he made. This is why things could turn out to be worse than they currently realise for people still consoled by the Democrats' success, because he now gets to spend two years 
campaigning and, and doing rallies, and every time it's pointed out that he hasn't achieved anything that he promised he'd achieve, even though his base still believe that he has achieved things he promised he'd achieve, even though he hasn't, when anyone lands a punch on him pointing out that stuff hasn't happened, he can blame it all on Congress. Yes, I mean, it depends if, if on If they'd your only let me do it, we'd have, we'd have a 40-foot wall now on the Mexican border, but exactly. I'm not allowed to do it because of those pesky <laughs> Democrats. Exactly, and, and it depends on your view of the resilience of the Democrats. Is last night's result the foundation, the beginning of a Democratic Party comeback? Will you and I, in exactly two years' time, be sitting on the James O'Brien show saying, well, it all started back in 2018 and now they've taken the White House? Or is a Democratic Party still talking about the possibility of another Hillary Clinton candidacy, mm. a Joe Biden presidential candidacy, a, a Democratic Party where Nancy Pelosi now becomes the most powerful Democrat, uh, elected Democrat in Washington, D.C.? Is that party truly ready for the prime time fight that yeah. it's going to be having on Twitter, on television, in Iowa, in New Hampshire, uh, at the conventions with President Donald Trump. Uh, be a brave man who woke up this morning and put a bet on them Wouldn't for it? November two years' time. I, I'm I think you're right. Finally, the, the, there are a couple of things that may change everything. Um, uh, the tax returns that Congress, as I understand mm. it, the House of Representatives could now subpoena those tax mm. returns that, that every president since about the 60s had previously felt compelled to reveal to the American public, which, but which Donald Trump keeps under his bed. Um, is there, what's the odds on that actually happening? I think the odds on the tax returns being revealed are greater than the odds on the possibility of the Democrats pursuing impeachment proceedings yeah. against President Trump. Nancy Pelosi has said here uh, within the last hour that she has no plans to move forward with impeachment proceedings unless the report by Special Mueller. Prosecutor Robert Mueller uh, unearths things that we don't already know and shows skullduggery was truly afoot during the 2016 uh, presidential election campaign. But the issue of the tax Tax returns gets very interesting. The Democrats are hoping uh, to use a law, I think it's from the late 1800s, that theoretically allows them, now they control the House of Representatives, to see anyone's tax returns that they want. And there's only one man whose tax return they really want to see, and that's the President of the United States. Are there all sorts of nasties in those tax returns that could uh, truly cost him support in 2020, or will they be a document that merely underscores the support for Democrats that already exists yes. to try and end the Trump era. We'll have to see if and when they get their hands on them, but that is an issue that I think they will be moving on in very short order. Simon Marks, fantastic stuff as always. Many thanks indeed to you. Who knows whether we will be doing it all again in 2020, but I, I think it's interesting from both sides of the Atlantic, my, my perception of this, and, and you know that it's very much against what I'd like to have seen or, or, or like to see, but for, for two reasons. Number one is the Democrats are still sitting there thinking, oh, don't worry, everyone will turn against him when they realise that he is an actual fascist. They won't. <laughs> history, history does offer no comfort for that particular position. And, and the second element being, of course, that he's not a normal politician. He doesn't want to govern. He doesn't want to get involved in difficult, complicated, detailed stuff. He just wants to get out there and, and campaign and absorb the adulation. And speaking of history, I, I'm not mad keen on always doing this, but the lad in Kings Winford Craig, the, the, the former soldier, said a few things while accusing me of um, spouting nonsense that aren't even remotely true. Um, especially the fact that the French government uh, offered up port facilities in West Africa to the Falklands-bound British fleet and introduced embargoes on sales after the Falklands started. We move on now to something completely different. Um, a story that...